allowing us to see a new year. We are recording now. This is being video quarter as well as audio. So if someone needs the video, we are getting that done right now. I'm still hearing people logging in. And we're excited. Hey, Amen. This is a man uh, uh, going to be an, uh, a new experience with this course for me uh, as well as you because most of you haven't taken this course before and we're looking really to get right into this course so before we go any further i uh, just want to welcome all the new students that are on uh tonight um and i think we still have okay someone's people are still coming in to the classroom so what everybody can do those of you that have cameras you can wave to your other fellow students let them say praise the lord just welcome into your class amen praise god okay. praise, the lord. praise the lord everybody <laughs> praise god okay you may mute yourselves right now we're going to get ready to get started uh, so we're gonna. I see right now. I'm gonna have to do some meeting myself. Um, okay. Um, if you can, I'm trying to find it. Who's talking? Okay, I think I found it. Um, okay, let's go into a word of prayer so we can get started. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for all that you have done, all that you have done. We thank you for the multitude of blessings. And God, as we go into this course, God, allow us, their God, to submit ourselves, their God, to your will, to your word. Their God, that you will have your way. In Jesus' name, our soul says amen. Amen. Um, I, I'm hearing some background images. I'm mute. Um, uh, I'm hearing some background the way someone is talking. And we're and it's picking up everything. I'm not. Okay. Um. Okay. Alpina, can, can you see who that the background noise I'm pick, picking up? I can't see who that is. Um. Okay. Um. I'm gonna have to remove them because I don't. It's, see um. It. Um. Angeline Brooks got to uh, mute herself because she keeps flashing. Okay, Angeline Brooks, uh, Mr. Brooks, can you, um, did you hear that? How, how do I mute it? Um, okay, let me see. Go to the bottom of your page. And you'll see where it says mute, stop video, invite, and all that. Okay, mine's not saying that. Okay, <laughs> well, I don't. Well, I guess it was your husband that was talking. <laughs> I don't hear it now. Oh, I got you. I got you. I got you muted. I have you. Okay. Okay. So let's get busy. Thanks to God, we do again want to thank each and every one of you for um, for allowing us to uh, come into your living rooms and some into your car, or wherever you may be. Amen. And we're getting to this course, evidence that demands a verdict. This is a course that is crucial and uh, important. Well, actually, it's the name of the book. The name of the course. Is actually the name of the book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. But it's what we call an apologetic course. The National School of Theology is an apologetic school. In other words, what that says, and you've heard me say down through the years, those of you that have been with me a few years, that this is one of the foundational teachings of the National School of Theology. We believe that everyone is an apologist. If you are named the name of Christ, you are a born-again believer, then uh, uh, being an apologist is not a calling. It's a way of life. You are not called as though you are a pastor pastor or some special calling that some people are called. No, anyone that is a child of God uh, is required by the word. The Bible says, be ready to answer every man. It didn't say some. Be ready to answer. And this is where we're stuck at today, that many of God's people don't have answer for the multiplicity of questions that people are throwing at the church. Well, this course, uh, uh, this apologetic course in the book of evidence that demands a verdict. We are going to be dealing with some hard questions. We're going to uh, bring forth some powerful answers that we believe that's going to help. Now, again, when it comes down to apologetics, um, we are um, actually have at least two or three different levels of apologetics, and this is actually the first level. But let me read about an apologist. We are all, we believe, number one, that we are all apologists. Number two, apologetics strengthen believers. 
uh, and we are recording this, apologetics help students hang on to their faith. Um, apologetics help with evangelism and um, uh, apologetics help shape culture. So, uh, but now you don't have to write those things down, but I just wanted to bring out the importance of being an, an apologist uh, that it uh, does aid and help. One of the things that I talk, want to talk to you just a few minutes before we get into the book is that many reasons why churches aren't growing, are not growing with the type of people that they need is because they're not able to give answers to tough questions. And when uh, especially educated people, uh, college people, people that have uh, some type of intellect, when they're asking hard questions, they're not taking the answer to be speaking, you speaking in tongues and, and going sugar mama, sugar mama, whatever. They want to hear an answer. They're not, they don't care about how many tongues you speak. They're not caring about how long you shout. They want some clear answers about certain things. So this course is going to help you to be able to minister to people that are atheist, uh, agnostic, people that are skeptic, and people that are theists. Um, uh, we done talked about what a theist was about a year ago. Does anyone remember what we said, what, what is a theist? Not atheist, but what is a theist? Okay, I think, and this is where you need to take notes because this will probably be on your test. A theist, again, is a person that believes in God, but is not necessarily a Christian, okay? A person that believes in God, but they're not necessarily a Christian. And I'm quite sure um, you all know what an atheist is, because again, this course is going to aid us in ministering to all of these levels of unbelief. So atheism is a level of uh, unbelief. Uh, agnostic is a level of unbelief. So can someone tell me what is an agnostic? Okay, agnostic pretty much is a person that I know you're, some of you are fast at Googling. It's a person that believes that there is a God, but believe that, but they have a hard time believing that you can communicate with God, that we as humans, uh, it's that the connection between us and if there is a God, that it would be merely impossible for humans to be able to, to have any type of relationship with something as a God. So this is an agnostic. What is a skeptic? What is a skeptic? Again, these are all types of levels of people that's out there in the streets. Atheist, agnostic, skeptic. What is a skeptic? As someone says they're a skeptic, are they, are they leaning toward the knowledge of uh, 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 the belief of God or are they leaning away from the belief of God? Boy, we are they're all- leaning, They're leaning away. Okay, they're leaning away. Right. Okay, agnostic is uh, agnostic is leaning towards the belief of God. A skeptic is leaning away from the knowledge of God. They really have serious doubts if there is a God. They're not an atheist, but they're having serious reservations. And you need to know the difference between an atheist and an agnostic, a skeptic, and a theist. A theist totally believe in God. More than likely, half of your children are, 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 are theists. They believe in God. They believe in the church. They just haven't given Christ, uh, given Christ their life. So uh, every Christian is a theist, but not every theist is a Christian. Okay? Every, the every Christian is a theist, but not every theist is a Christian. So you need to know that. It might pop up in a test. So uh, a theist, just take, to write the word theist, just take off, the, uh, take off the first letter A, and you have the word theist, OK? Any questions, comments, or statements before I go any, any further? OK, now I hope you have your Bibles with you. You're going to need that. So if you need to run real quick and get your Bibles, you, 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 you're going to need it tonight. You're going to probably need a tablet. And because we're going to this is a master's and doctoral course, and, uh, and it's going to have some um, again, for some of you that has never been in a doctoral course before, you're going to see uh, that th this is not your associate's program, and uh, and we do have a standard on the doctoral on the doctoral level that you must maintain a B. Uh, uh, especially if you're in a master's, you, you must maintain a B average. 
Uh, if you're in the master's program, you must maintain at least or be average to go into our doctoral program, okay? So, um, so um, let us, so if you got your Bibles handy and you have your book handy, let's go into our book. Um, one of the things that the book does talk about, even before you get into chapter one, I really like a lot of the commentary that it did talk about because <coughs> many, <coughs> Excuse me. Many of our people believe that serving God is just blind faith. Um, did anyone read what it says even before you get to chapter uh, uh, one? What it says about blind faith? Are we serving God blindly? That we just believe that faith by that's all God wants to have is just blind faith. Is that so? No. Okay, uh, Elder Gwen. Um, no. You want like, to uh, speculate a little bit more on that? He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know his characteristics. He wants you to know who he is. He wants to know who you are in him. Amen. Amen. So, so here, again, when people say, well, there's nothing but a blind faith, that's not so. God desires for us to really get to know him personally, to get to know, uh, again, um, who he is uh, and um, his his understanding his word if it was just a blind faith then we wouldn't even need a bible uh, um but that's what i was thinking also because he wouldn't give us so much history so much detail so much prophecy and so much word and uh, to guide us amen thank you uh, pa pastor Wright. yes that's he has given us so much in other words he's given us evidence the Bible is nothing but evidence. And in order for evidence to take place, evidence is, and, and most of us don't watch CSI and all these other uh, other shows, uh, and evidence usually points toward the truth. Evidence is going to point toward the truth whether a person is innocent or guilty, but the name of that book is Evidence That Demands a Verdict. And if you read the life about this man, he was an atheist at one time. He did not believe in God, but the more he began to do his research, he found out that there's a God. So anyone that do their due diligence in searching about God, they're going to find evidence Again, that God, again, um, is God and he's God alone. And the Bible is full of evidence. Not only is the Bible full of evidence, where else besides the Bible do we find evidence that, that push the validity of, of God in Christianity? Where else do we find it besides the Bible? Archaeology. Archaeology. And we're going to get into that later. What, what else is there evidence about God? Where, where can we find it? Nature and the Bible itself. is full. Say it again. In nature itself. Nature, the heavens declare the glory of God. Okay, anyone else? Where else do we find evidence? There's one place that everybody's missing. Yourselves, you are evidence. The, the mm -hmm. fact that God, that, that you are a new creature is the evidence. Uh, of God, the fact that what he's done in your life. Again, you are the greatest witness uh, and the greatest evidence that you can supply to others about. And this is what Paul done to King Agrippa. Paul uh, didn't go and, and, and present archaeological findings and facts and figures to Agrippa. He presented what? His own personal testimony. So every child of God need to have a personal testimony. Now, so let's go into chapter one the uniqueness of the Bible. And before we get into apologetics, we just want to talk about our Bible because actually 99% of most Christians know very little about their Bible. You ask them about their Bible, they say, we ask them, what do you know about your Bible? Oh, it's leather. No, we're not talking about it. <laughs> and you got, you got to laugh at, at some of God, see if they make me laugh. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that. No. No, tell me something about your Bible. Well, it's King James Version, okay? We're warming up. We're getting warm, but we got we still got to do a lot better than that. Okay, let's talk about the uniqueness of the Bible. And um, what does it mean to be unique? When something is unique, what uh, break down the word unique for somebody. What is unique? Different. Okay, it's different. Anyone else got have any adjectives that to describe uh, uh, something that's unique? Something that's unique to me is one of a kind. 
Well, it can be one of a kind. It stands out. Okay, so we'll, we'll go with that. So the Bible is unique. And when you look on page 16 in your book, now you need to know at least uh, a half of these, okay? It says it's unique. Why? Because written over a 1,500 year span, written over 40 generations, written by over 40 authors and, and every uh, walk of life, including kings, peasant, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, scholars, etc. This is That's one bit of information you need to know. There is no other book that can claim that it was written by 40 different people that um, lived in different places, different uh, aspects of, of life, and, and talked about the same thing. No other book. There's not one book that can claim that. And, and now, it names some of the authors. Moses being a politician, uh, political leader, excuse me, Peter, a fisherman, Amos, a herdsman, Joshua, a military general, and it goes on and on. It goes on to number four, written in different places. Moses in the wilderness, Jeremiah in a dungeon, Daniel in the hillside, Paul in a, uh, uh, in a in behind prison wall, Luke while traveling, John on, uh, on our Patmos. Saints of God, that'll preach. <laughs> so just knowing your Bible is preaching material or teaching material. And most of you all here are pastors. These are things your congregation need to know. Now, if you're going to be a pastor worth your salt, your congregation need to know about the book that they open up every Sunday. And if they don't know that there's 40 different authors that lived in multiple places at different times, different ages, and different stages, again, we've got to do a better job uh, job because every every one that names the name of Christ should know something about the Bible. And this is just the basics right here. So let's not just teach them what's in the Bible. We need to teach them about the Bible, period. This is bibliology. Any question, comment, or statement before we go any further? I'm recording this, and I do know I talk past this, but you have to record it, and you're able to get the recording uh, upon request. I'm going to try to slow down. And that's what I thought was interesting when you told us to read the first chap first three chapters, that when he was talking about the salesman with the um, the book, that he was selling and how he was discussing. Um, hope I'm not going too far ahead. That's okay, go ahead. Um, that he was discussing his book and how he pointed out that the book he was talking about, that all the authors were in the same um, time frame, from the same area, doing the same culture and all that. And then he discussed the Bible with him and and he asked him some questions and how he the gentleman said no and by the time he got done talking with him about the bible that gentleman ended up being getting saved amen amen just on the fact of the uniqueness of the bible people will can give their life to christ because it'll blow them away how many people in the world know that the bible was written by 40 different people over 1500 uh, 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 year span that's that's amazing you're not going to find any other author again that can claim that you might find a book that's written by two maybe two people three people at the most more than likely but 40 different people at different times talking about the same thing and there is no contradiction and we're going to get into the contradiction before we uh, hang up tonight anyone else question comment or statement yes. bless you pastor young <laughs> i finally made it <laughs> that's okay we got you amen okay let us move on we're still in chapter one and just moving uh through the pages a little bit uh when you go to page 18 again there is no other book that has been published as much as the bible um when you look at all the different translations and the publications of all these there is no other book uh it said the Britain Book, a Bible Society, over 490,000, uh, again, copies. Uh, there, again, there's in the millions. In 1932, there was 1,330,213,815 copies. But uh, again, it's the number one. We're not worried about those facts at all. We're not worried about that. Uh, does anyone re uh, recall reading about the, the man's name called Voltaire? Did anyone read about Voltaire? B O L T A I R E. Okay, turn to page 20 for me, everybody. 
Turn to page 20. Here is a story that you need to know about. Okay, page 20, looking into the second paragraph where it says 2D, it says Sidney Colic is, is um, and all about Bible says, Volunteer noted a uh, French infidel who died in 1778. Now, being a French infidel, that means that he was not a Christian at all. He was an atheist. Said that in 100 years from his, his time, Christianity will be swept from uh, existence and passed into history. But what happened? Voltaire uh, has since passed into history while the circulation of the Bible continues to increase almost in all parts of the world, caring and blessing whomever, wherever it goes. Now, but I, I, I can't read, I'm not going to read all this, but you need to know that Voltaire made the proclamation that before his death, he, that it, well, he said in 100 years that, that Christianity would be wiped out. Well, actually what happened was after he died, uh, there was one Christian society that came along and bought his house and now his home is printing Bibles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what is mind blowing. That when you come against God, God can take your evil and turn it around for good. So God took, so God took him home or took him somewhere, turned around and <laughs> bought his house and turn this house into a printing factory. Tell me that God don't have humor. Who <laughs> says that God is not humorous? Amen. Help me, Jesus. <laughs> wow. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So that's so that is some of the uniqueness of the Bible. Let's go into chapter two. Okay, it says how the Bible was prepared. Okay, now, um, and we understand, um, again, uh, concerning, again, they didn't have, you know, computers back then, they didn't have, you know, the various tools that we have today, and, um, but what was the main material that was used back then? It's, it's right in front of us. Iris. Iris, okay. Um, Elder, since you read that, can you read a couple of paragraphs of what it says, where it says 1D? The failure to recover many of the ancient manuscripts, the manuscript is a handwritten copy of the scriptures, is primary due to the perishable materials used for writing. All autographs, writes F.F. F. Bruce, have been long lost since. It could not be otherwise. If they were written on Pyrus, since it is only in exceptional conditions that Pyrus survives, for any length of time. Among the writing materials available in biblical times, the most common was Pyrus, which was made from Pyrus plant. The reed grew in the shallow lakes and rivers of Egypt and Syria. Large shipments of Pyrus were sent through the Syrian port to buy Bibles. It was uh, submersed that the Greek word for books, Biblos, comes from the name of this port. The English word paper comes from the Greek word for pyrus, We're gonna pyrus. Break. We're gonna, Thank you, thank you, Ella. Uh, so what stands out here that this was uh, a material that really didn't last long. So since it didn't last long, then what was it that needed to be done to keep um, the writing fresh and keeping the writings continuously going? What did they have to do? They had to keep redoing it. They had to keep constantly rewriting. Rewriting. Constantly it. rewriting. And so that brings up one of the miracles is that with all this constant rewriting uh, over and over, you don't see a large amount of errors or uh, 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 anything that's erroneous about the Bible. So you're looking at copies and copies of copies. This this papyrus wasn't able to last, you know, like hundreds of years or 50 years. It had a short time span. So the people knew that. They had to keep copying it and copying it. So we're looking at the miracle of the Bible that it survived and kept its integrity. It survived, not just that it survived, it kept its integrity. That's what makes the Bible powerful. The survival and its integrity was st still stayed intact. Well, 
how, well, how is that important? Why is it important? Well, if you tell 10 people, you, if you tell, have a, uh, we did this little test, uh, get line up 10 people, you tell the first person something, but I time it, that person turn around and tell someone else and everybody turn around, you'll find a story that didn't change. Where it was black, now it's white. Where it was tall, now it's small. Because people, it's hard for people to tell the same, to, to tell the same story um, uh, and to hear what they hear. Their memory is different. But what's unique about the Bible, all of these authors, again, talked about, again, the, the, the same Jesus, the same God, the Abra uh, again, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of them got, kept this thing straight. And then during the, the publication and the republications of this book, the accuracy and the integrity was still kept. Anyone co question, comment, or statement? Mm. Mm. Okay, um, I want to go to chapter three and um, um, let's go and talk about the canon. Now, let's pre-adventure that the Bible wasn't the only book being written at the time. I'm quite sure other people uh, were writing. Uh, other people were um, getting uh, a lot said and, and putting it on paper. So how would people know in about a hundred years what writing was uh, authentic? What writing was that that God inspired? So what was the process for them to know uh, what manuscripts were sacred and which were just somebody just talking? Um, can, does anyone know the answer to that? What well, canonization? Okay, canonization. So, so explain the process of canonization. Anyone? You want us to give the steps out the book? Sure. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Okay. As long as you understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it had to be, you know, God given. Okay. You want to tell everybody at. where you're at? <laughs> oh. Um, oh, I was just doing it from memory. Um, oh, oh, okay. Okay. Go ahead with your bad side. That's good. Go ahead. <laughs> um, oh, remember, I was just going to go look for the list. I was doing That's it from memory. That's on page 29. Page 29, everybody. Page 29. Okay. Now, this is important, everybody. This is important because, again, uh, when an uh, atheist or agnostic will say to you, um, well, how do you know that, uh, that every book of the Bible uh, is, is, is uh, again, God-inspired? And how do you know which uh, of the manuscripts? Uh, well, there was a process that they went through. The process is, is crucially important. Um, hold on for a second. I'm in class, I have to call you back later. Okay, so um, so here, as she's getting ready to read to you, look down to the bottom, the test, a book for uh, inclusion in the canon. So, so any book or manuscripts had to go through a test. Just because they said the word God, just because it said hallelujah, wasn't enough for them to be included uh, into the canon. So, uh, 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 Pastor Wright, would you like to go through this list for us, please? Okay. Is it authoritative? Did it come from the hand of God? Is it prophetic? Was it written by a man of God? Is it authentic? The Father had the policy of, if it in doubt, throw it out. Is it dynamic? Did it come? Uh, okay, okay, hold on, man. You're skipping a little bit on theory. Oh, this enhanced the validity of their discernment of canonical books. Okay, stop right there for a minute. Okay, okay. now what was said again uh, in its authoritativeness, it says, did it come from the hand of God? Again, this was crucial. In reading it, they had to sense 
that this is coming from God and not man, okay? Does this book come from a divine source uh, where it says, and, and it, it had to say more likely, thus says the Lord, not thus says John Peter or a rocky bow boy. It had to say, thus say it's the Lord, okay? Is it prophetic? It is, again, is it speaking concerning past present and future things now but what it says in number three this is crucial it says if in doubt throw it out if there was any question concerning the authenticity to the, the the prophetic anointing on it then they if there was any question or any uncertainty it was not added and this is why you'll see a different amount of books in the in our bible compared to what you find in Catholicism. They have more books added. Their books, some of their books did not pass the, our, our, uh, our test, the canonized process, and they allowed certain books in that did not pass. And so, but uh, that's what they want, that's what they want. Okay, but number four read, and five, read it for us, please, Pastor Wright. Is it dynamic? Did it come with the life transforming power of God? Was it received, collected, read, and used? Was it accepted by the people of God? Okay, so these are five, or at least five, of the criteria uh, for the manuscripts to be, have been put into the Bible. So when you look, now, there are certain scriptures that uh, are in certain books of the Bible where there is no author. So how is it the book of Hebrews made it and there's no, no one is certain of the author? Why did the book of Hebrews make it in? No one knows who the author is. Even though they, well, like we were reading in the book, even though they may not have known who the author was, it still passed the test. Okay, and anyone it. else? I don't know because I have, I have a question of how um, a book was quoted or mentioned in a book of the Bible, but the book itself didn't make it into um, the canonized um, version of the Bible. Um, okay. So. I, I can hold on to your question. Hold on for your okay. question for a minute. Let Let me deal, and we're gonna come right back to that. Um, again. Not every manuscript necessarily uh, fit all five because we're, we're, one of the things that was important was that a prophet was the author of it. But there are some books where you couldn't tell who the author was, but it had prophetic overtones by reading it. You can tell, even though you didn't know the prophet's name, you could tell it was written by a prophet. So whether they knew who the prophet was or not. The fact it had the prophet, prophetic overtone, it had the, uh, again, all the others uh, criteria was there. It was dynamic, it was life transforming. People were reading it. It was accepted by the people of God. So uh, again, so we're not gonna say that every book met all five. Now, um, Elder Penny, now what was your question again? Okay, in Jude, it um, clearly um, speaks of, um, oh, Lord, <laughs> and I brought this out to myself during the time I was reading because I wanted to get everyone's feedback on it, and now I have forgotten the exact book. Um, I think I'm going to answer your question. Yeah, okay, um, okay. I think I'm going to answer your question. If not tonight, I think it's going to be answered in another session because I, I think I know what you're going to do. Because that's not the only book. The also, even um, if yeah. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, who was that then that wrote about the life of Moses? Right. Which is very, very similar to that. Right. Right. Oh, that's what it was, Jude in the book of Enoch. Right. Enoch about the book yeah. of Enoch. It is right. Right in here. So why isn't the book of Enoch included in the canonized version of the Bible? Why did we, why did we decide, or why was it decided, we didn't decide, why was it decided that the book of Enoch should not be a part of this? 
Well, uh, again, the only thing that we can pretty much surmise that those uh, the the men of God back then, even though it it has some elements, it didn't have enough. Then wouldn't it have made sense to remove the reference in Jude? <laughs> well, um. I can't speak for those men there, but but I, I am gonna make notations <laughs> see what I can find on that. Okay. But you know the Book of Enoch is in the Catholic Bible. It is. Yes, it right. is. It is. Mm -hmm. Yes, but Jude is in Saint Jude is in our in the canonized yeah. version. Uh -huh. and it clearly, clearly quotes something from the Book of Enoch. So now. I mean, when I read that, I'm like, well, where's this book of Enoch? You know, well, but, but I, have, I, I have since then acquired a copy of it, but I'm just saying, it just seems to me. Well, that's that, not the um, only book that does that, though. There, mm -hmm. are, there are other uh, quotations from the Old Testament about other books that uh, people were mentioning that's not a part of our Bible. And, and, I, and I do believe that, um, that certain, that, if you had it in there and you can go get the Catholic Bible, that uh, what would it add, add, add to our Christian life? And I think they looked at it and they judged, oh, we could add it, you know, but they don't think it would have given us no more than what we already know. And I always said this to my, my little, uh, and I'm not a genius like those people are, I'm having a time trying to live these 66 books. I'm not trying to add, uh, add, add some more. <laughs> so for a book, I just want to live live these here. So uh, we can at one time there were uh, actually I think seventy some uh, books that were there, but uh, we uh, took it out. So, um, but in a way, but we're gonna get back with that even more so we find what some of the other uh, others have said. Does anyone else have any any question, comments, or statements from chapter one through three? I have a question. Um, there's a verse, um, I don't, I can't remember right now where it is in the Bible that's missing mm -hmm. from some Bibles is verse 21. Cause some Bibles jump from 20 to 22, but I don't understand why that verse is missing. Some Bibles have it and some don't. Okay. But I, yeah, we're gonna we and we will get to that as well. We will get okay. to, we will get to that as well. Um, okay. And you're right. There's there's there are Bibles out there that did that. Um, the New American Standard Re Revised Version Bible um, has uh, taken out certain words. The new uh, Revised Standard Version has taken out certain words. Where the King James had the word virgin, there are some Bibles that use the word girl. Uh, so I'm still a King James Version person, I and I still look at some of the other versions, but my issue is this, is that King James says in, um, uh, I think it's Corinthians about a virgin, but some of your newer versions uh, take that word virgin out and put word girl and there is a major difference the last time i did my research between a girl and a virgin every girl is not a virgin so and i think the fact that there is a a, a vast difference between a virgin and just a female i think the word virgin should have stayed there but we'll discuss that because we're going to really get into some things tonight um i, I want to question, um dr short uh, do you have a different version of our book than i have because the page numbers that you're mentioning don't line up with. The Thank book. you. Thank you. I <laughs> ask the same question. I thought I was losing it. Yeah, page 29. I didn't find 29. It's not on 29. Well, you know, so that's what I'm saying. Like, are you, because you're quoting. Do you have this? You have the volume one and two, right? Yes. Yeah. That's why. I, you yeah, have. That's it. why. That's why. No, no. I have the old version. Uh, right. Pastor Young, what book do you have? I have both. You had to with the both. Okay. So yeah. okay. So what? So what I'll do then, instead of naming pages, I'll just say chapters, and hopefully we we'll all have the same chapter. Now, in your chapter three, guys, tell me, are y'all dealing with the canon? 
It is. That's where it begins at. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. And so I was looking for the list that you, that you that you quoted yeah. from. I okay. So I so the list starts in chapter three. Okay. Do you see it? Yeah. I had that book you guys have too, and oh. um, <laughs> I want to say somebody stole it, but none of my stealing Christian books. But I no longer <laughs> have it. Okay. So what we're gonna do? So I I I I'll. Keep note of that, that uh, you guys that have the newer book. Again, this book has been out since, my gracious, probably about 30 or 40 years. And so now he's the, uh, and, and you have the right one. I think that's the one you want to keep because it has a much harder cover than what I have. Mine is a very soft cover. And then if you can see, um, uh, well, you can't see because I have on, um, yeah. I have my screen sharing. Can everybody that's, uh, see my screen sharing right now, but I'm sharing yes. on my screen. Yes. This is yes. why those of you that are just calling in, it's gonna you want to download the app so I can share what's on my computer with you guys. You can hear what I'm saying, but everybody else can see what I'm getting ready to show them and, and share. So make sure next week download and make sure you can um because we do share a lot uh, on my computer with, with the students and the students are able to share as well. So now what I want to stop right there, we're not going to go no further in the book than chapter three. I want to make sure that you understand. Okay. Most of you've already read it, but make sure you understand, read through chapter three. The first uh, three chapters is crucial. And again, pastors, again, I hold you responsible. Make sure your members understand some of those things. I think it's crucial that everyone, just not theologians, everyone needs to have some basic facts about the Bible. And that's just jump to just basic material right now. But now let's go to, let's jump into the deep a little bit. Now, many of God's people deal with um, tough questions all the time. And the reason why this course is in, important, because there are people out there that said they don't believe in God because the Bible contradicts itself. They don't believe in, in um, they don't read the Bible. And these are people that are, are, are readers and notorious for reading poetry and history and things of this nature. And they said the Bible contradicts itself. And if we are not trained to deal uh, with some of these what seem to be contradictions of the Bible, then someone's going to catch us up. And I want to go over a few tonight, and I'm going to give you some homework assignments in your research. So your homework is getting ready to come up, and I want to just share this with you. I'll be So we should be done in about uh, 15 minutes. So give me 15 more minutes. So what's on your page is talking about what is a contradiction. Okay, I'm going to email this to everyone. So don't try to write it down. I'm going to email it to yourself. So save your pen and pencil. <laughs> But it talks about, um, I have a touch screen, so I'm using my finger. Uh, it, it breaks down what is a contradiction. Now, now for your home, um, let me let me stop a minute. Let me go to something here. Um, let me see, apologetic press. Okay. Um, now, in your Bibles, I want you to go to Numbers 22. Numbers chapter 22. Everybody know the story about Balak and Balaam. And I want to bring something out um, because the Bible has a, a hundreds and I'm saying probably hundreds of what seem to be contradictions. And if we as apologists don't know how to straighten up what seem to be contradictions, then we're going to be messed up. Now, what I'm going to send you concerning contradictions. Now, it said on that paper, I'm not sure some of you had a chance to read it, but it says if, if there's a, a, a person, let's say that everybody tell you that, our, that Dr. Shore is rich, and then someone else says, Dr. Shore is poor. Is that a contradiction? No, that's someone's opinion. Well, it's someone's opinion, but they both can be right. And how they both can be right, one person could be talking about young Dr. Shore, another person could be talking about old Dr. Shore. 
One person could be talking about spiritual. One could be talking about natural. So again, just because something seems to be contradictory, we must do, again, our homework and our research and seeing why this. And this is what happens. When you are an atheist or agnostic or a skeptic, they're not trying to find out the real truth. They just see something, hey, here's a contradiction because it says here is black and other person it says it's white. And so we're going to go over multitudes of areas where things seem to be contradictory. But I want you guys to figure this one thing out tonight with me. Okay, as we look at the story of Balak and Balaam, God told, remember that Balak sent two hosts of people to go to Balaam and said, Balaam, we're going to pay you to curse the children of God. Balaam mm -hmm. said the right thing. I can't go with you. You know, I can't do it. Balak sent the prince. The prince said, look, um, we're going to pay you seriously. We're going to give you some, I'm paraphrasing. We're going to give you some good money. Balaam says the right thing. I wouldn't go with you if you give me a house full of gold and all this. He says all the beautiful things. Okay. So, but Balaam tell him to uh, stay tonight because God might say something. God might speak to me. And I'm paraphrasing this, but I'm going to have someone read it in a second. And so, so that night God tells uh, Balaam, look, um, I, if the prince come to you, if they, if they come to you, go with them, but only say what I say, okay? But then we find out that seemed like that, well, he went with the prince and God got mad. But I'm going to ask someone to read, starting from chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 18 and read down to verse 22. Can someone read that for us, please? And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, if Balak would give me his house, full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord, my God, to do less or more. Now, therefore, I pray you, tarry ye also there this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the man come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall send to thee that shalt thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes to Moab. You said the 21? Yeah, read, read on read on a little more. Tell where God got angry. And, I'm sorry. And God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Okay, now, let's stop. We, we, we can stop right there. That's good. Okay. A uh, question, everyone. Um now, some atheists will bring this up. Well, wait a minute. God told him, gave him permission to go. He went. So why did God get angry? Is not God here? Isn't this a contradictory in the Bible? God saying one minute you can go. Then God gets angry because the man do what God told him to do. Uh, we need some explanation for this. How would you explain this? He went for the money. He, he did went for the money. Yes, he did. Okay, but what where is what there is a word that is missing that's going to explain everything and show that he went for the money though. Because you're right, Pastor Young, his motive his motive had changed. But what showed that his motive had changed? Because of God told him that you can go, but just only be obedient to me. So he didn't really get God directions of what to do before he went. And he went because he was offered more money and he began to see greed in his eyes. And, and he realized that you can't curse what God has already blessed. But he was determined. He go back to God the second time when God, you don't go back to God the second time when he done told you what to do. Okay, so now you got 99% of what I wanted, Pastor John, that you were so close. Okay, is there something else that we can add to what Pastor Young had just said? He really hit 90 up there, uh, but there's something he kind of said and didn't say it. Okay, read exactly what God said. Read it again, someone. Okay. Oh, oh, verse 20? Yes, yes read, read that where, where God gave him permission to go. 
And God came to Balak at night and said to him, if the men come to call you. Stop right there. Stop right there. If the men come to call. At the men come. At yeah. the men come. Okay. That's the problem. He said, if the men come to you, then you have permission to go. But. Did Balak wait for the men to come? No. 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 He went anyway. <laughs> he just, went. Went. He oh, just okay. got up and went. He was excited about that money. Man, that's all he needed was just that. And this is why it's important, again, to hear every word that come out the mouth of God. And as a prophet, I teach this all the time, you got to be clear speaking. God said, if the men come, you may go with them but only speak what I say. But Balak, he didn't hear that last part. He All he was doing about was gold, gold, gold. He got up and and and, and uh, Pastor Young, you was right. He he did that because his eyes was full of gold. He, all he could see was money. And that's why God was angry because he did not follow God's order to the T. And mm -hmm. this is why we have to study apologetics because every little word is important. And if we want to skip over that part where God did, then we're going to misinterpret. We're going to mistranslate. We're going we're gonna to preach wrong. We're going to teach wrong. This is why this course is important because we're going to have to make sure that we are responsible for every Every word that come out of the mouth of God, and this is what apologetics is about: is getting it taught properly. Because atheists, agnostics, and skeptics, if they go to the average member in the church, the average member of the church is not going to see this, and will not be able to figure it out. That's you know so true. That, that is that, that is an excellent, and I mean, um, it, it's something so small, but it equates to something major. Because yes. to miss the fact that he did not wait for the people to the men to come to him, he just got up and went on his mm -hmm. own. That is easily overlooked. That part, that is, and it is something so small, like I said, but it's something major. You can't overlook the fact that the men did not come to him. God gave him permission if the men came. But he didn't wait for that. And that is major. Yeah, thanks. Amen. I like that. I like Amen. that. Okay, we girl. say it to our children all the time. What were my instructions to you? What were mm -hmm. my full instructions yeah. to yeah. you? Mm -hmm. Did mm -hmm. you follow my complete instructions? All right. And that's, <laughs> the, and that's the fact. He did mm -hmm. not hear. He wasn't paying attention. He heard go. That's all he heard. Exactly. Exactly. Because that was the part that gave him the permission to do what he wanted to do. Wanted to do all mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to hear go, and that's what all that's all I wanted to hear. Uh-huh. And I got my permission to go and I'm going. Amen. And I'm going. And Amen. you know, when a lot of people preach that, they leave that part out. And mm -hmm. so, in other words, then they began to misinterpret the scripture. That's there it. you go. When That's this it. is preached, most of the time, it's, this part is missed, messed up. Also, and, and again, uh, we only got about five minutes left. Another scripture that I shared many times with you, where it says, eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard, neither into the heart of man the thing that God has prepared for his people. And if you don't quote the next part of that, that yeah. goes with that, you're you're misquoting God's word. Yeah. But it goes on and says, but God has revealed. You know, so it's not like he haven't, but the, but the first scripture by itself is like God did not. Eyes haven't seen, nor ears have heard. But the next verse clears it up. Now, here's your homework, saints of God. Uh, uh, but I do want to say, uh, Pastor O'Neill, uh, again, all the way from Louisiana, do you have any questions, comments, or statements? Hello. Bless you, man of God. God bless you all. And I'm glad to have attend this first class of uh, seeing and hearing the voices of, uh, of God's people. Man. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I do want to say something um, about uh, even this particular writer of this book that, uh, you know, our phones have the tendency of, of showing a lot of things on it, just pop-ups. Right. And on my phone, it popped up like auto book. And, uh, -huh. uh and I, I went into the app and did it, and I was able to pull up uh, the, this type of book, the, the evidence that demands a verdict. Mm 
Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd say to you, it'd be good for you to do it and to just, it, it reads it to you. You listen to it. Oh, okay. And it, awesome. and it tells you in depth about um, the writer. And, and, and so often we read the writer, but we don't know what the writer went through. Right. And that, that particular writer, you would be amazed at uh, what he went through to even be believing God. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what had happened in his life as a child with his dad being a, an alcoholic and um, uh, being raped and all these different things. When you begin to see that, he had more against him than he had for him. Mm -hmm. but, but, and, wow. And he, had, he had murder on his mind. He wanted to kill his daddy, and he also wanted to kill those two men who raped him. Lord. But, but because of he, because he seek to serve God and to understand God better, God, he found that God did a better job than he did, and these men eventually died. So, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't turn him away from God because right. if I'm trying to seek something that's almighty, all good and all excellent and all bad is happening to me, uh, wow. what's, what's going to happen to me to make me believe in uh, this God that we talk about? Wow, Amen. wow, wow, and that's he, deep, that's he, deep. He was not deterred. He, he had a lot of reasons not to. Amen. But he said he was glad he didn't want to serve God because he, he said that he was in an area where he was convinced, like you said, we have to convince people. Amen. And it says that if people talk, he says a lot of times when people say things about uh, against God, they really want to know God. Praise the Lord. Amen. If, you, Come. if they listen to you, you can convince mm -hmm. them. Amen. Thank you, Pastor O'Neill. Again, we do thank God. Another, another brother on here uh, uh, from New York City, uh, Pastor Shannon, you're on. Amen. We haven't heard from you tonight, but I'd love to hear something from you. At my hometown, yay. New York City? Yes. Apostle Shannon, are you on? Let me see. You're not muted. Let me think. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if he's... Okay. But, you know, okay, so we'll we'll catch him next time. Uh, I think we heard from everybody. Uh, the lovely voice you heard was Pastor Young from Iowa. Amen. So, amen. So, because we, we, I want to say this, we want to make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to say something. And it, as part of your curriculum, that you participate in the classroom. So that means at least one time you need to make a have a question, comment, or a statement. Okay. At least one time. So, Pastor Young, you did have a comment, but uh, man of God, we thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, who else is there? Angela Brooks, Elder Brooks. We thank you. Okay, she's muted as well. So I just want to thank all the students. Now, here's your, let's get to the homework so we can. Okay, this is your homework assignment on the screen now. Who killed Goliath? Why is that? A, why is that homework assignment? Well, look at Second Samuel twenty one nineteen. Mm -hmm. There was war against the Philistines of Gob and Ehem and the son of Jeroboam, and the Bethlehemite slew Goliath mm -hmm. the Gittite. The st uh, with the staff, the spear, like a weaver, bling, bling, bling. Okay, so so who did kill Goliath? Was it David or was this person here? Okay, <laughs> so so look it up. Look, I just I just need you. That's part of your homework. I'm going to send it to you, though, okay? Um, now, here is three or, three or, uh, or, or seven years. Now look at the uh, 2 Samuel 24, 13, and 1 Chronicles uh, 21, 12. One part talks about three years of famine, and the other one talks about seven years of famine. I need you to figure that out. Why does the Bible sell you one place three years and another place seven years? So that is also part of your research. And last but not least, I'm sorry. Are you 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 said you're you gonna send that to us? Yes, I'm gonna send it to you. Yes, okay. I'm gonna send it to you. Don't worry, don't write nothing down. Okay. okay? Uh, and you'll get it tonight. Okay, inconsistencies about incest. We know what the Bible says about incest in Leviticus 18:6 through 30. Again, uh, it, it it teaches against incest. But why is it we know the story about um, Abraham and, uh, and 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 his wife uh, Sarah and others that seem to be related, half sisters and brother, cousin, things of this nature. So is so the, so is that inconsistency? on the subject of incest. Is it wrong or is it not? It seems like God tells us it's wrong one place, but then he allows others to, to do what he said was wrong. So these are three major topics. 
I think, did I have three or was it four? Oh, my grace. I'm sorry, guys. There's four here. But you know what? I'm going to send this fourth one to you if you can get it done. But I definitely need the first three done. Because uh, one place it says God is a God of light. Another place it says God is a God of dark. So which one is it? Is he a God of light or is he a God of dark? So, wow. so this is going to be sent to you guys. And I need you to do your uh, uh, homework. Now, stress of you that are on the doctoral level. In doing your homework assignments, you need to cite your sources. And, and don't go to one source. Don't go to one source and write down what they say. Look at multiple sources because you might find a contradiction, a contradictory uh, when it comes down to uh, these uh, these professors. You might find one believe it this way, one believe it another. If you're finding that there is a discrepancy or a debate among those men, put the it was put it put it down. Let me know. Do not stick with one. So again, if you can't do the four, do the three again well, and we would not we're not worried about the dark light. We'll do this in the classroom on next week. So you will get this homework sent to you. Uh, uh, and give me about an hour, and I get make sure everybody get it. Okay. So we're uh, does anyone have any last questions, comment, or statements? I got a question. I got a question yes. for the man of God. Um, what's the name of that app? What app? Did he uh, that he was talking Wait. about for the book? Oh, 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 oh. Um, uh, um, Pastor Neil. Yes. Okay. What were you looking at? You seen that? Uh, I went on the. It's called Audible. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Audible. A U D I B L E, and mm -hmm. what it does, it, it gives you a bunch of free books that they will read to you, and mm -hmm. then but they also let you pick one book. And I decided to see if I can find this particular book that we're looking at. Okay. Oh, punched it in, and it gave me that one book. Audible. Okay. Is and it audible.com? Uh, it's an it's this audible app. Audible go app. Go to your app on your app store. Oh, okay. okay. Awesome. Thank awesome. you, sir. And and sit there and listen to that from the beginning to till it gets to the chapter. But you need to hear what he went through. Okay. Uh, before he wow. even became to write this book, Amen. and what convinced it, what convinced him to go to school and, and learn more about, it. because wow. he was he was arguing, but he ended up arguing for it instead of against it. You know. <laughs> Amen. But, yeah, that's what blew my mind. He was really planning on just ripping. A hole in Christians, but the yeah. more he began to try to argue against God, the mm -hmm. more he found out that there was a God, and you can't have no greater testimony. So we believe in the three C's: convince, convict, and convert. Amen. God bless you, saints of God. We do thank you. We're gonna pray our way out. And I'm and I'm from Orange, Texas. I'm not from Louisiana. Oh, oh my gracious, Orange, Texas. Thank you, man of God. Thank you for correcting me. But I am on the border. It's <laughs> orange, you in Louisiana in five minutes. Oh, okay. I thought so. Okay. I've been through the okay. Okay, right. you're right near the border. Bless you, man of God. Okay. Uh so let, let's close that in word of prayer. Father, right now in Jesus' name, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness. We thank you for all that you're doing and all you've done. We thank you for these men and women of God. And God, as they study hard, God, we say you will be with them, give them the patience, their God to be able to do what they have to do. And God, as we depart from this class, God says you will keep each and every one safe and in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everyone, and we'll see you on next Monday night. Give me about an hour or so, and you will uh, have your homework assignment. The scripture is given to you. Good night. Amen. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a blessed week.